Well, thank you very much for allowing me to be here with you. Uh, it's a strange world we live in, yeah, and it's true that I've worked with uh, many of the names that you mentioned, and uh, I've been in business with Zachariah Sitchin and Richard Hoagland and all kinds of interesting people over the years. And it was only until about 1989 and 90 I decided to uh, go public uh, myself. I had been doing lectures since 1962, but they were always private stuff. And I started out, of course, in little mom-and-pop bookstores and library rooms and just just speaking to audiences uh, just because I love doing that. I love talking about things that most people don't even know exist. And so I have been able to be in the company of uh, extraordinary people for many, many years and learn a lot from everyone, and I'm still learning today. That's why I always like to say, and I'm not I'm, I'm not uh, the world's foremost authority on anything. I'm just an ordinary man pursuing extraordinary knowledge. But I'll tell you what, there's a lot of things out there in the world that people just do not know. That's been out there for a long time. You could find it yourself, but it's so well hidden. And, and you have to be uh, in the right company at the right time to hear about things which uh, most people are never going to be privy to know about. And I've been fortunate to be in that company. And uh, so that's why I love doing what I do, as difficult as it has been on me. But um, it, it's, it's a give and take in the universe. You, know, you, you get what you pay for. And so I've always felt that uh, sacrifice is the measure of credibility. Well, <clears throat> if, this, if you want this kind of knowledge that I deal with, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you a lot. It's cost me my marriage. It's cost me... My family has cost me uh, uh, you know, some really tragic things in my life because of what I do, uh, along with being threatened and, um, and you know, that kind of stuff comes with it. But on the other hand, the kind of knowledge which I've been given and being able to be in the company of to learn is so extraordinary and so profound that I understand why. The uh, you know why it costs so much to learn these things. So I'm always happy to be on a radio show that I can share a little bit of what I've been doing. Absolutely. You know we get attacked very frequently. As a matter of fact, uh, we were just assaulted by a fundamentalist Christian, verbally assaulted. We were called Satanists because our show delves in the occult. And when yeah. we explained to her, well, yeah. occult means hidden. She turned around and said, well, it's hidden Satanism. Um, yeah, what, right. wh how would you describe the occult? Occult is a Latin word which is used in the medical industry. Doctors know the word well. Uh, and you ask any doctor, what does the word occult mean in the medical profession? And they will tell you that there are certain organs in the body which are referred to in, in their terms as occult uh, organs because you have to go in when you're cutting, you have to remove something to get to something which is hidden. And so they're referred to as occult organs. And so uh, occult simply means something which is hidden. Well, uh, anyone who's got more than 500 brain cells all going in the same direction should know that the power elites of this world, as far back as six to 10,000 years, have always uh, felt that important knowledge is on a need-to-know basis. And you don't need to know. Like George Carlin says, it's a big club and you ain't in it. <laughs> but the people who uh, but the people who run the planet have things like CIA, Central Intelligence Agency, NSA, National Security Administration, uh, all great corporations, big corporations, and big government uh, require as part of their uh, operation require knowledge information, intelligence. They pay big money for informers and intelligence. So knowledge is power. And the church is one of the oldest uh, beholders of occult knowledge, hidden knowledge, hidden wisdom. And it was always placed in the hands of the priests because even during the Middle Ages, during the early Middle Ages, um, as far back as the 4th and 5th century, the people, generally speaking, couldn't read or write. 
it was only the priests in the, in the churches who were taught how to read and write. And so they developed what we today refer to as languages because they were communicating among themselves and writing it down. And so today we are now finally uh, evolved enough that we can actually start educating the normal person in the street to read. But um, and so unhappily, all they read is the, is the uh, sports page. But at least during the Middle Ages uh, and in the medieval times, and even before that, the people could not read or write. All they could do is go out and work the land for their masters who owned them and the land they were living on. And it was only until the coming of the Renaissance that we, uh, in about the 1500s, when we began to get the idea that maybe it would be better if the whole world could read and communicate with each other. So that's where the printing press comes in and, and schools now are you know, everywhere. Uh, and so I, I've watched the evolution of the human race over the centuries in, in history, and, and I'm, I'm afraid that we are digressing now. We started off with a good idea in the U.S. of A. Uh, with educating people. But today, of course, uh, like the Christians say, we're not, we did not evolve from chimps and monkeys. I agree. The real case is what we're evolving into chimps and monkeys because nobody seems to read or care anymore. It seems like and we're devolving. Say it again? It seems like we're devolving. We evolved, well, and yeah, now well, we're devolving. Yeah, that's what I said. We are evolving into chimps. We're evolving into monkeys, not from them. And so, uh, uh, you know, when you start breaking down the words and terms that are used in theology and religion, oh, man, what a story that is. I mean, when people call, talk about the devil, the word devil is simply a D, the letter D in front of the word evil. You write mm-hmm. evil and then put a D in front because devil. God, our word God, can be traced back to, in the, in, in the dictionaries, God in Latin uh, is Dios, Dios, Dios. And, uh, and Dios goes directly back in Latin to the god Zeus. So Zeus in Latin is Dios, and Dios in English is God. So when Christians are talking about God, they're talking about Zeus. And uh, and so, you know, the, the very word God also uh, comes from the root word that gives us our word good. So you take an O out of good, it becomes God. Obviously, God is good. And devil is a D in front of evil. It's just word play. And uh, unfortunately, a little bit of information is very is very dangerous. So we've taught people to learn to read but they only read a little bit. They're not too interested in real, legitimate study, like an academician. They they are just read a little something, hear a little something, and and before you know it, they pass it on to their children. Their children pass it on to their children. And today we have a world filled with ignorant, ill-informed, unread, uh, dim-witted people who are are think that they have the whole truth and nothing but the truth. In point of fact have no truth whatsoever. And when you really get into theology, and that's my subject, I talk a lot about the um, political systems, and I'm trying to get away from that because I've been talking about that for 48 years. But when you get into theology and religion, that is where the real story is. That's where the real stuff is because... uh, our words and terms that we use today in everyday life come directly out of the church. I mean, you've got to remember that Rome <clears throat> has dominated Europe for at least 2,700 years with the coming of the Caesars of Rome and the ancient Roman Empire, and then in the 5th century when it began to crumble, and in its place the Vatican came up, uh, the people who were financing the Roman Empire began to pull the money out of Rome because they saw it was going under and began a new operation called the Vatican. And uh, you know, and so that whole Roman system is still with us today all over the world. Rome still controls Europe, and Europe still dominates the world. 
the planet. And so we've got 2,700 years of the church keeping secrets. That's why they have enclaves and secret meetings and secret societies. It's in motion pictures. It's in television shows. Everybody knows that. I mean, we're not privy to know what goes on, but you know, like in the movie Godfather 3, it shows the mafia, the Cosa Nostra from, from Sicily, sitting in the Vatican, doing business with the Holy Father. Mm-hmm. Uh, well, we know all of that stuff happens, but you're not privy to sit in the Vatican and hear, like a fly on the wall, what's really going on, and where the money is coming from, and where it's going, and what the Vatican really is, and who the Holy Father really is, and what the real political situation on the earth really is. You're not privy to know that. Now they have well, a um, they have a library under underground, don't they? That's oh, like thirty five yeah. miles long. Yeah, yeah, and it's got carpets and lighting, and it's beautiful. And some of it is extraordinarily high tech now too. But I've seen pictures of the uh, underground libraries: beautiful carpets. The walls are, of course, the old uh, chiseled out uh, walls and, and the catacombs, but they're cleaned up. They've got lights now. They've got uh, beautiful carpets everywhere. And you can walk for miles and miles and and see all the documents and materials. Nothing but shelves. Yeah. Yeah. And as a matter of fact, I think of that movie Angels and Demons, or was it uh, Da Vinci Code, one of the two, took you inside the Vatican Library? Well, I know there are libraries like that. And those things you will never be you'll never be privy to know what's in those libraries. So, in a matter of speaking, they're hidden from you. They're not hidden from they're not hidden from officials, but from you. So, in a matter of speaking, uh, we could say those documents in the Vatican Library are occult because they're hidden to you. So, there's nothing wrong with the word occult. It simply means hidden, and you know everybody pretty well knows today that that the really important knowledge that we need to stay alive has been hidden from us. All we have is Big Top Pee Wee and, and Bugs Bunny and <laughs> nonsense, nonsense uh, you know, and basketball and football and all the silly nonsensical games and game shows and, and uh, soap operas. And, and uh, it's just amazing what the human race is consuming and what our mm-hmm. masters are pouring into the public trough for all of us to lick up. Uh, I have no, I have no time for this kind of nonsense because my life is short. I want to know who's running this planet, what God really is, where did we come from as humans, uh, how does government and banks and, and courts and how does the world really, in fact, work? That's what I've spent my life pursuing. And I can tell you that nothing on this earth works the way you think it does. And I need to repeat that. Nothing in this world works the way you think it does. Churches don't do what you think they do. Police department isn't here to do what you think it does. The courts are not here to do what you think they do. So you need to wake up and find out the whole world is different than what you think it is. And you only find that out when you go into a federal court and they tell you to sit down and shut up because now you're in trouble and you don't know how. You don't know what you, something to do with income taxes, but you don't even know what an income tax is. Mm -hmm. And you don't even know how governments work. You have no idea in the world how how a court works. Courts work just like uh, you play tennis on a court. You play basketball on a court. You need to understand a court is a game. And the whole idea in the court is to put the ball back in the other guy's court. Well, absolutely. We just had Rob Menard on, and he was saying the exact same thing. And it's amazing yeah. to see this global shift in consciousness heading in that direction, realizing all of these things. Yeah. I mean, it, it, well, finally, people are starting to wake up and see that all we're talking about, when you talk about big religions and big government and, and major powers in the world, what you're talking about ultimately at the end of the day is basically the Crips and the Bloods. We're talking about gangs, very successful, uh, old, highly attuned, well-financed gangs that have grown up. And you know, there were a bunch of little 
uh, guys running around shooting people. And then it got to be bigger and bigger. And one day it was called Mafia. Now it's organized. And then from Mafia takes the big money that they're raking in from their prostitution and all the other nefarious enterprises and putting it into Sears, General Motors, and they are and they are you know they are buying into heavy duty shares of corporations, so that Michael Carleone and the uh, Godfather One was telling his girlfriend, you know, Kate, one day in uh, five years the family is going to be completely legit, meaning. The mafia is is growing. Uh, the underworld organizations of Russia, the uh, the Russian mafia, the Italian mafia, but especially the Mexican and the, and the Tong society of, of China, the uh, Lakusa from uh, Japan, all the incredible amounts of money that the Iraqi got there, if they are investing in American corporations. I mean, Lakusa, from what I've been able to see, Lakusa, which is a uh, Japanese mafia, is owns now Bank of America. Bank of America is owned by Lakusa, the the Japanese mafia. How many people know that? How many people know that uh, that uh, Union Bank? That's a very big bank in California, Union Bank. Mm -hmm. Virtually nobody I know uh, is aware that Adolf Hitler set up the Union Bank at right, the, the German Nazi Bank. Union Banking Corporation that was headed Union by uh, Prescott Bush. That's right. But it was but the idea was dreamt up by Adolf Hitler and given to Prescott Bush to do. So Union Bank is a Nazi organization from day one set up by Adolf Hitler. Do you think anybody in this town of Los Angeles knows anything about that or couldn't care less? Because when I tell them, they get glassy-eyed and sit there and stare at me like they're seeing Santa Claus or Elvis Presley come back. They have no idea what I'm talking about. Well, it's amazing. I went to the bank and I asked the teller, where does our money come from? And she says, well, it's backed by gold, of course. That's, that's how no. it's created. <laughs> <laughs> and I just tell her, sweetheart, go take a lunch. You're off to lunch. Well, it's a bit ridiculous how they're dumbing down the population. And um, like you mentioned earlier, at one point in time, it was actually forbidden to know how to read and write. That's right. So they're keeping these That's people exactly dumbed right. down for good reason. That's but ladies and gentlemen, and Jordan, Chris wanted me to ask you a question. He wanted me to ask you about the RH negative blood and if you've heard anything about it and if we can get your take on that. Well, you know what? There's a bigger story, I think. And the bigger story is the mutation of the human race. Um, I, I've been watching this coming for a long time. I know that at the end of the day, after everything is heard and everything is said, that there is something going on in the world of cyberspace computers in relation to mutating the human race. It's so subtle and so large in scope that that's why it works and nobody seems to see it coming. But I understood this a long time ago when I first read uh, a book many, many years ago called The Corporate Man, in which they talk about the mutation of the human being, uh, the, the, the mind of human beings, the way our brains operate and the way our minds operate, and they are computerizing us. Uh, and slowly but surely, they're developing something called a computer. And the computers are becoming more highly advanced by the day. But there is also this whole subject of the mutation of the human race to connect the human mind to a computer. In fact, and they, well, I've been reading about uh, human cells being connected to uh, uh, you know, software and a computer so that the brain is actually, the human brain is now part of the computer. And somewhere along the line, the computer is going to become part of the human brain. And uh, so there's that kind of technology going on behind the scenes, which incidentally was uh, pioneered by the Nazis. Computers were pioneered by the Nazis. All kinds of high technology and science was, was pioneered under Adolf Hitler. Most people don't know that. And so uh, I've got a tremendous amount of stuff on where television was being developed, the German doctors who were working on it, 
how they were being financed by uh, international banking cartels to use television as a propaganda tool to uh, to begin to sway the whole earth to begin to remake man. We recently uh, had we recently had Chris Everard on the show, and in his movie Spirit World, I believe he says that the television was first created as a way to speak to the to spirits. Basically, does that I have any? I wouldn't surprised. Well, yeah. Okay. Okay. Because that makes sense. I mean, you know, if you go back and think what it must have been like when they first come up with the idea, it probably had something to do with Tesla, but um, because Tesla said he was talking to extraterrestrials, mm-hmm. uh, and I would be a bit surprised because so much of the of the uh, knowledge and technology which we take for granted today, uh, my God, where did that stuff come from? Where did the concepts even come from? Well, are we seeing are we seeing the continuation of the Third Reich, or are we seeing the Fourth Reich? Well, we're seeing the Fourth Reich because the Third Reich uh, was, it was never defeated; it just lost a particular battle, but it was never defeated. Okay. The fourth Reich or the Third Reich is still in its place. We just refer to it as uh, the Fourth Reich. Uh, you know, they're coming back again. It's like the, it's like a big companies in L.A. I see them all the time. They're going out of business. They got a special going on a business sale. They're leaving town forever, and then once they close the doors, two weeks later they open up on the other side of town, brand new, same guys, same people, same employees, different name, and uh, we're back in business again. <laughs> well, that's what happened with Nazi Germany. Adolf Hitler did not die. That's a bunch of, uh, of bull. He never. He, Adolf Hitler never died. Uh, he didn't commit suicide. That's stupid. Recently, they said that their body was. A woman's body. Yeah, that that makes more sense to me. <laughs> I, I know I know enough about dictators and and powerful people. They don't die. They're not going anywhere. The only way they're going to leave is you kill them, or they die of natural causes or something. But normally, uh, powerful people do not put a gun to their head. That's all in movies. Mm-hmm. They don't do that. It's a it's a club, it's a fraternal order. And if you you're playing on the chessboard of world power, and if you get overthrown, they just give you a lot of money and send you off to an island in the Caribbean to live comfortably with your harem, and uh, and that's the way the world works. That's well, right. we were just talking about this the other day. Wouldn't it be cheaper to just put a bullet in his head, though? Besides, the- well, yeah, but the thing is that that's not the way the 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 system works, even among the mafia. Even among the gangs in Los Angeles, there are certain rules and regulations. Ah, okay. In the military, certain rules and regulations you cannot do. I don't care how, if you got the gun, if you are in charge, it, it doesn't matter. Certain regulations and rules apply, and that means you can't do this. And you in the mafia, you cannot kill a made man unless it is voted upon, and if you do, then you're a dead man for doing it. So, right, right. So there are certain rules and regulations among the world power elites. They have their own uh, operation going. They have their own words and their own terms, catchphrases. They they all at the top of the world, all the way around the earth, all the governments, the heads, and the powerful people in the world, they know how the world game is played. And there are certain rules and regulations you have to follow. Now, these symbols that we see everywhere, um, I know you're a master of symbolism. Um, are these just to laugh at us? Are they to communicate within each other? Or do they actually draw power from, from these symbols? Oh, they draw power from them, absolutely. But I, I guess the best way to uh, to explain it is uh, the, the symbolism that the gangs, the graffiti, that gangs spray on walls. Uh, to all the people driving through the city seeing this gang graffiti, uh, it's a disgrace. Our kids will mess up a property by with spray paint. But no, no, no. Those symbols mean something, and you can be killed if you do not respect those symbols. Because to the powers uh, that those those gangs who put those symbols there, they are very serious, and those symbols mean something, and the other gangs know what they mean. And if you're looking to, uh, to go see that, and if you're looking to go see God, then you wear the wrong colors and go into a particular area of Los Angeles, and you're a dead man. 
Why? Because those symbols that are sprayed there mean something. They are symbols that tell you something. And uh, that's the way the world works. Well, the power elites of the world don't do that, spray can on walls. Now, they put it on television. They have the President of the United States give a, uh, a speech in which he uses terms that only those people who are well informed as to who he really is and what he actually represents and then knows how to, you know, been trained to know how to interpret what he just said. And uh, that's what's always amused me. After a presidential speech, you've got all of these dumb clucks that come on uh, to explain to you what the president just said. ABC <laughs> has their commentaries, and NBC's got to explain to you what the president said, as if you're so damn stupid you didn't hear him and wouldn't understand what he said. But in point of fact, no, no. Uh, I w I'm more interested in what did he actually say uh, to the occult secret societies of the world. What was he saying to Lukusa in Japan? Uh, how was this understood among the Tong Society of China, uh, the international uh, communist movements, the international criminal cartels in, in South America? Uh, what was he saying to them in artfully designed words? Uh, so there's a world out there of, of knowledge that most people will never be privy to know. It's just disgusting. There was a symbol I remember him using... Um... It was something about yes we can. Yeah, I think you brought you brought that up. Can you explain for the listeners a little bit about that? Well, I, I, not that particular term. I was more interested in uh, since you brought that up about Obama. I I did a, I, I started talking. I think I, you probably heard me talk about this before. That back in 1967, I was in Glendale, California, researching at the Glendale Library. And I was looking some information up in the World Book Encyclopedia on Russia, and at that time, the Soviet Union. And in the World Book Encyclopedia, 1967, uh, there was an article about the Soviet Union, and, and on the first page in the encyclopedia had a picture of the flag of the Soviet Union, which was the communist flag, the red flag with the, <clears throat> with the pentagram, uh, the red star. But then beneath that is, was a picture of the national coat of arms of the Soviet Union, the national coat or seal of the Soviet Union. Um, the national coat of arms or the seal of the United States is, of course, the, um, the uh, eagle on the back of the dollar bill. Right. It's called right. the national seal. Well, the Soviet Union had a national seal. And, uh, and my, my video... It's called Dawn of a New Day, uh, talks about that. And I talk about the fact that as far back as 1967, when I saw that national coat of arms, I realized the implications of that symbol. The sun was rising behind the earth for world communism. And so I, I, I talked in my uh, video, which uh, I still have on my website, <clears throat> you can get called uh, Dawn of a New Day. And it's a 90-minute uh, lecture I did with pictures showing the Soviet National Coat of Arms and how it has been used uh, throughout the world by the Illuminati, communist, and Nazi, fascist organizations around the world communicating with each other. And in there, I talk for about 10 minutes about um, a term which is bandied about in Christianity, but is actually an Illuminati term that came out of the uh, old secret societies of the Jesuits. And that term and that, that words were the new dawn. Now talk about the new dawn being a catchphrase that the Jesuits have used, that the secret societies of Freemasonry in Europe have used, and how Adolf Hitler used it, the communists have used that term, and what it meant. Well, you yeah, know, I, 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 I don't mean to cut you off, but Obama just renamed the war in Iraq New Dawn. That's right. <laughs> wow. See, uh -huh. Now you're catching on. Yes. Now you're starting to catch on to what's really going on here. And people are saying, well, he's changing it because, uh, because after September we're going to stop pulling out the troops and everything's going to be... Fine. Now, I said, no, 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 go back 
and take your head out of, the, out of the ground and open up your eyes and understand New Dawn means something to occult Freemasonry in the world. If you understand international uh, criminal organizations, international secret societies, and fraternal orders coming out of Europe and Asia, then you will know what that term New Dawn really means. And the, you know, but if it's told to Americans, all you need to know is it's going to be called New Dawn, and that two dollars will get you a cup of coffee, and go back and watch a ball game because there's nothing for you to worry about because of none of your business. Stick your head back in your iPod. Stick. And welcome back to Truth Frequency. This is Chris Gio with my lovely co-host Cherie, and we are speaking with Jordan Maxwell. The websites are jordanmaxwell.com, truthfrequency.com, and polygraphradio.com. And that clip was of Michael Sarian um, from his latest DVD, Architects of Control. If you haven't seen that yet, I suggest you check it out at architectsofcontrol.com. Now, Jordan, um, we were just um, heard a clip about mind control. So, uh, I, you know, it makes me wonder if these people are mind controlled from sticking their head in their iPods, like I would, like we were uh, laughing about earlier, or um, are they dumbed down? I mean, what's going on here? For instance, I was at a restaurant the other day, and we were sitting around, looking around, thinking, how many people have actually heard the term New World Order? And so I go up to just some random girl, and she's actually got her head in an iPod, and I ask her, have you ever heard of the phrase New World Order? And she says, no, I haven't. What is it? <laughs> and I really didn't know what to say. <laughs> I felt like Morpheus. You yeah, know? I wanted I to say, <laughs> unfortunately, nobody can be told what the New World Order is. But how do you reply to a question like that, Jordan? Um, how do you explain to somebody what the New World Order is? Well... You know, I, I do get that a lot, and people want to know, you know, you'd be surprised some of the incredibly stupid questions I get asked. <laughs> uh, but I, I try and tell, you know, I've come, become very jaded now at my age, and I tell people when they ask me, look, it, don't worry about it. For you, the best thing to do is go back and watch football. And the reason why is because at this late date, if you don't know what's going on on the earth in these last few hours that the republic is alive, the last few hours that the human race has now in its final hours, uh, like the Titanic, she's already one half under. She's going under now quick, uh, and people are bailing out. So at this last and final few minutes, if you don't know what's going on, my suggestion is to go back and watch television. And when, when you're put into concentration camps, don't worry about it because at least you can see football. They will have sports on, on the, on, on the uh, TV for you when you're in prison. Because I told if, you. you're, if you're an adult and you don't know by now what's going on, then you're not supposed to know. Right. I told her to Google it. That was the only thing that I could come yeah. up with. Incredible. Yeah, absolutely. I'm just amazed how many people... You know how many people go to church and don't even know where the word church comes from? And to, how many people talk about Jesus Christ and have no idea in the world what, what the word Christ means? Yeah. Uh, talk about worshiping God and have no idea. It goes back, you can trace the word back in any good dictionary to Zeus. I mean, how many people go to uh, uh, go to vote and think they're voting for the president and point of fact, no, they're going to the polls. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when you go to the polls... All that means is that somebody is taking a poll, mm -hmm. not a vote. And a poll is to get a consensus of what people are thinking. So they take a poll. So you go to the, the voting polls, you go to the voting booth and the polls, which means the masters who run America, and there's only a handful of them, these few people who run this country, they just want to see which one of these airhead goofballs you guys like. Do you like this fruitcake over here or this fruitcake over there or this mentally deranged moron over here? Which one do you like? Or which ideas because, are going to gain the support so they exactly. can kind of move the agenda in that direction? That's exactly right. So which yeah. one of these fruitcakes do you like? Because they're all mentally deranged. They're all under our control. We've got all kinds of photographs with their, with their women and their boyfriends, and we've got all kinds of stuff on them. So we're going to put these chumps up to run for president. 
but which one do you people out there in, in video land, which one of these dopes do you like? And so when, when, when the masters see that everybody likes this one guy, then that's the one we will put in charge of the corporation. Mm -hmm. And so everybody will be happy. They're happy because they got their leader. Now, you, you didn't get anything. You know, like Dick Gregory used to say, <clears throat> in America, you can... In America, we like to brag about the fact that we can elect, but you cannot select. That's the difference. So you can only elect the three or four chumps that the masters put in front of you. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. all of them are either cross-dressers, mentally deranged, have got criminal records, uh, or totally mentally deranged people. And But they just want you to go to the polls and let them know which one of these fruitcakes do you want, uh, will, will you feel good about. Well, the way I see it, they need people who have dirt on them so they can hold it over them if they get out well, of, of line. Course. Yeah, of course. That's why. That's why uh, in the the uh, skull and bones, you have to lay in a <clears throat> lay in a coffin naked, and you must talk and tell audibly. You must tell all, all the men who are standing around the coffin. You must tell them of your secret sexual uh, escapades. You must tell them about all the secrets that nobody knows about you. You must do that, and the men are standing around you listening to you, and that is what you must do. <clears throat> and the reason why is very simple. Then they accept you into their fraternal order, and now you are in a very powerful position to become of governors and senators and congressmen, and they know that you will be trustworthy. So they have not, they've got you recorded. <clears throat> they know exactly what you've done, and they can ruin your name at 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So they know you will be a good what we call team player. You had better be a team player because the organization, you know, the mob, is going to be very unhappy with you if you decide you don't want to do something they told you to do. But your name is going to be out there in the paper tomorrow morning with all of your real escapades <laughs> that, that could be brought against anybody out there. So, we yeah, that's it, the way it works. We saw it with Senator Craig a couple a year ago, something like that. He started yeah. going out of line of the agenda, and boom, immediately. Well, that's what happens. He yeah. won't do that anymore. Absolutely. <laughs> um, if I can go back to religion for a second, there was something in one of your talks that really inspired me, and that's when you said we have to look beyond the gods of religion and approach the creator of the universe as a great king. Yeah. And the prayer that I prayed was, um, God, please you know, take me whatever direction you want to take me. I'll walk whatever path, no questions asked. And lo and behold, two years later, here I am speaking to you. And it's really amazing. So I'm ever eternally grateful for that. But there is another thing in that same talk that you said, and I had a question about, I speak Greek fluently, and in the Greek language, when we speak to somebody of authority or, you know, with respect or, or you know, to show respect, we speak in the plural. Now, is it possible that when you said that the Elohim was actually a plural word, is it possible they were just referring to God with that same respectful tone that the Greeks would use? No. No, and I know that I know that argument. I've seen the argument made many, many times, and I understand what you're saying. <clears throat> but and of, or, of course, it is understood. It can be understood that way. But originally, <clears throat> in the original language, if you go back to the Phoenician Canaanite language, which we today call Hebrew, there is no Hebrew language. <clears throat> there is a Phoenician Canaanite language, which the Hebrews speak. And when you go back to the ancient, uh, the most ancient times, it was understood that it was in the plural. And but with the coming of Christianity in the Middle Ages, and especially from the 16th century on, they began to pick up the idea and use the idea that the plural actually was a way to um, was, was just an honorable way of of um, addressing someone with special honors, so it would be like a plural honor. And I've heard those arguments, but in, in actual fact, no. You go back and watch the way the religious uh, words and terms have have uh, come down to us over the past 5,000 years or so. Uh, the answer is no. Originally, in fact, it meant plural, but it has become, um, it has become accepted 
that uh, today, especially in modern day, that is, is plural can mean that it was just a uh, an extra honor. Uh, you know, so now, these these gods um, are they the gods that landed in Sumer? Oh well, that's that whole different subject. Uh, yeah, there's so so many places we could go with all of this. Um, what was that I was going to say in relation to that thing about Elohim? Um, in the beginning, the gods created the heavens and the earth. <clears throat> uh, this is why in Genesis 128, when it's talking about, well, yeah, when it's talking about the the creation of Adam and Eve, and it says uh, the gods said, "Come, let us." Make man in our image after our likeness. Well, logic alone would, would dictate, and I ask a Rabbi Antelman, I've asked a lot of rabbis, but in particular Rabbi Marvin Antelman from Newton, Massachusetts, was a dear friend of mine for many years. <clears throat> he ended up on the Knesset in Israel, but he, we were very close friends and used to correspond and talk on the phone for hours. And uh, and I asked Rabbi Marvin Antelman about, the, about this uh, plural... And the use, and uh, you'd be surprised some of the things that rabbis will tell you if you if it's off the record. <clears throat> and um, so, when you come to the idea of God, what, what I was going to get back to, I, I forgot, was that um, the very word God in the Greek is associated with the word Theo or The, T H E or Theo. Theos, yes, yes. And so. Theos, or theology, is where, you know, the study, ology is the study of, and theology is the study of God, theo, or theology. <clears throat> but the same root word gives us, uh, of theology, or uh, theo, gives us our word theater. So, in the ancient Greek world, the uh, it was called the God show. It was called a theater. It was a, uh, an open-air uh, theater where there would be plays, morality plays, which we, which would be acted out, and they were called a theater. Well, that's what the church is today. It's a theater. You go in. They don't have a, you know, they don't have a screen. <clears throat> it's an actual act. It's going on. You pay money and you go in and sit in the in the, in the theater, and learn about theos or theology. Uh, it's a God show. Amazing. I, I've, I speak Greek fluently, and I've never made that connection. Yeah, well, there it is. I, I, and uh, why is it when, when, the, when the Catholic Church or the priest walks out, everyone rises? For the same reason that in a courtroom, when, a, when the judge walks out, everyone rises. Why? It's because all churches operate under all churches, Catholic and Protestant and Jewish. All churches operate under maritime admiralty. They operate under international maritime admiralty law, the law of the sea, mm -hmm. and the law of water. That's why you need That's a passport. Exactly. Yes. And so well, you go from one port to the next. You can't pass with, uh, unless they know who you are, so you've got a passport. <clears throat> and the law of admiralty is the law of water as opposed to the law of the land. But we have two things going here, the law of the land and the law of water. Well, people have heard that term, the law of the land. But the law of the land is simply the custom of the people who live on a particular piece of land. But the law of the land is different in every land. Well, there are things you can do in Russia you can't do in America. There are things you can do in South Africa you can't do in China. So it's the law of the land is the law of the custom of the people who live on that particular piece of land. But the law of water is all over the earth. And so the law of water is banking law. This is why a judge rules from the bench. When the judge walks out, everyone rises because he is, he is representing maritime admiralty. And this is why in a courtroom you've got a fence and a gate. And the people sit on one side of the fence and gate, and the judge with his entourage sits on the other side of the fence and the gate. And the fence is there to divide the land from the water. And that's why when you are, your name is called, you put your hand on the gate to open it up. What you don't realize is when you put your hand on that gate, uh, that there's a piece of wood across the top of that gate, 
and it's called a bar. And so you're not you're not licensed to pass the bar. Only an attorney is licensed to go in and out and pass the bar. You're not. And so when you put your hand on the bar and you're not licensed to pass the bar, immediately you are now in hot water. And someone's going to have to bail you out. And because your body is 90% water and it's biological water, if you can't be bailed out, you know, your ship is sinking. And if you can't be bailed out because you're in hot water, then they're going to take your body, which is a battery, and put it in a cell. That's why you're sitting now in a cell, which is a battery. <clears throat> and if you understand how international monetary systems work, I, you know, as I said, maritime ability is the law of water or the law of banking. And when the judge walks out, he sits down on the bench. But we say the judge is ruling from the bench. What, what is a bench? <clears throat> Look it up in a Latin dictionary. A bench is a bank. And what does a bank do? A bank directs the flow of the currency because it's a river bank. And so it a, it's a, directs the flow of the current. See, because your money is the cash flow, the liquid asset. It's uh, the law of water, maritime ability. How does this relate uh, to How does this relate to UCC? Oh, the UCC is merely a part of the whole superstructure of maritime ability. All of this is talking about the law of water is the law of bank, and the judge rules from the bench, which is a bank mm -hmm. <clears throat> in Latin. Uh, look it up in a Latin dictionary. Bench. Is a bank because in the Middle Age, in the Middle East, thousands of years ago in Jerusalem and Syria and Lebanon, and even today in Egypt, uh, you walk down the street <clears throat> and there'll be people sitting on the street and they got a bench in front of them and they're selling things. And if you buy something, you have to lean down and they will make the change there on the bench. And they're selling their watches or whatever off the bench, and, and you put your money on the bench. So the word bench is a bank. And so the judge rules from the bench, which, he be, which means he is representing the bank. And therefore, since he's ruling, ruling for the bank, <clears throat> somebody's going to pay their debt to society. Mm -hmm. Somebody's going to pay. So bring your checkbook. And if you can't pay, then you're going to jail where they will put you in a cell because you're a biological battery. <clears throat> and they will, and you know, your body is a security on the New York Stock Exchange. Right, well, right. A lot of people don't know that. The birth your certificates actual body, are traded. Yeah, it's being yeah. traded every day. Your body is being bought and sold around the world and traded on stock exchanges around the world. And uh, but uh, happily, that's not important because it has nothing to do with football. <laughs> and so, well, I mean, it's true. It has nothing to do with anything that's of importance, like basketball and and Britney Spears or any of the silly nonsensical games that people play. Uh, I'm a, I'm just interested in the real world. Well, you're you know, talking where about where the real people operate. I'm interested in knowing who is owning us and our bodies. Who owns your body? Who controls your country? Well, Where are you going? And I, and I always say to Christians, if you think for one minute that when you die, you're going to go before God and you're going to be judged before God, then my suggestion to you is that you had better start thinking <clears throat> about what you're going to say when you're before God and you find out that you never knew the truth about anything ever and that you were deceived by the great deceiver. Because you're telling me that Satan is a very big deceiver. He's the master deceiver who could deceive. Uh, the whole world could be deceived by him, except you. <clears throat> and the whole world is standing in the power of the wicked one. Satan the devil is the great deceiver who deceives all the nations of the people of the world, except your church in Alabama. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the only one that he didn't get. And I'm thinking to myself, so when you die, and if you're going to go before your God, you're going to look like a five-year-old that's been caught doing something by, by the father. And your father's going to be looking at you, and you know he found you out. 
So now you're trying to kick the, the pebbles on the ground and put your head in your pocket and kind of act dumb like you didn't know what you were doing and try and come up with some kind of an excuse that he will buy. And so I tell Christians, get ready for that. Because when you wake up on the other side after you die and you're before your God, you're going to find out that you will lie to from day one. You never, ever came close to knowing what was going on. So now you're going to have to explain to God how you got to be so damn stupid. <laughs> And welcome back to Truth Frequency. This is Chris Geo, joined as always by my lovely co-host Cherie. And we are discussing uh, religion with the one and only Jordan Maxwell. His official website, once again, is jordanmaxwell.com. And Jordan, like I was saying before the break, I don't think that all this truth is going to be presented to people on a silver platter. I think it's going to be esoteric knowledge that you have to dig out for yourself. It's just like uh, if you were working out. You know, you're not going to get a perfect body by sitting around eating fast food and whatever's thrown in your face. You're going to have to go to the gym. You're going to have to jog. You're going to have to really work to get that perfect body now why wouldn't the same thing be with a perfect mind um you know you're gonna have to seek this knowledge out if you want to find well it. of course that's what the scripture says now. of course that's what the bible says uh, i've even got that one of my uh, one of my lectures uh, quoting right from the bible it says that something to the effect that god that the honor of god is to conceal a matter <clears throat> as it's a con to conceal a matter is mm -hmm. what god does and to search out that matter, to search out that secret, is the honor of a man. So God gives you secrets of the universe. He gives you secrets. Well, think about it. The life you live, where did the earth come from? You know, like that one astronomer said, the universe is not only stranger than you imagine. The universe is stranger than you can imagine. There are mysteries out there, all out into the universe. There are mysteries here on earth you haven't even looked at yet. And so, you know, the creation by God, so to speak, is a mystery. And uh, happily, most people do not have the intellectual acumen to deal with the mystery, so they just watch TV. <clears throat> but if you've got a brain and you start thinking about what the Bible is saying, what the holy books of the world are saying, it begins to, you begin to see that there's a whole different story than what you thought was there. The Bible is filled with with, a, with an incredible story. I don't put the Bible down. I'm not complaining. I'm not suggesting the Bible is worthless and useless. No. My feeling about the Bible, the, the Christian, the Jewish Bible, is that there is a profound, awesome stuff uh, hidden. <clears throat> it's hidden in the Bible. And until and unless you start looking at the Bible as a metaphor, as a symbolic metaphor for something very ancient, which has been known, and, and when you start breaking down the words and the terms and seeing what the Bible is actually saying, all of a sudden it takes on a completely different uh, hue completely, and then you see for the first time the churches are as far removed from anything spiritual as, uh, as anyone can be. There is nothing spiritual in Israel, period. There's nothing yeah. holy in Israel. There's nothing holy in Rome. There's nothing holy in Salt Lake City. There's nothing holy anywhere on the earth that has to do with man-made corporate religions. It's just the Crips and the Bloods, gangs that are vying for power. There's nothing holy in Israel, as I've said before. The only thing holy in Israel are the stories that come out of it. They're full of holes. When you start looking at the words and terms and symbols and the actual history of the Jewish people, the actual, real, legitimate, de jure history, not the silly nonsense they put on the History Channel and, and, and the Discovery Channel, but go to the libraries and get the old reference books and really go back and see where the Christian church actually began <clears throat> and who this man Jesus actually was not who you thought was. And then you begin to see that the New Testament itself is simply a metaphor. It's a symbolic story telling you something, and that's why it even has Jesus saying, 
though I don't believe Jesus ever existed. It's a metaphor. And the metaphor has Jesus saying, many will look with their eyes, but not see, and will listen with their ears, but not hear, and with the heart, not get the sense of it. And that's exactly what's going on in both Judaism and Christianity and Islam. All three are people of the book. Because all three religions, both Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, re- re- rely on a book without the, you know, without the holy writings. Well, you know, I seem to remember a passage um, from the Bible that says, "Keep your eye on God." Now, were they referring to the pineal gland? Well, uh, that's exactly what they're referring to, precisely. And then the, the Jesus, they have, the Bible has Jesus saying, "And if your eye be single." Then you, know, then you will be able to be in touch with God. What, what do you talk about the single eye? Your eye? If your eye shall be single, then your body shall be full of light. But if That's your right. eye is full of darkness, how great is that darkness? That was Matthew exactly. six twenty-two. Yep, yep. That's it. And so, as I said, I believe that the... I, I know what the Old Testament is. The Old Testament is a <clears throat> is a is a document in commerce. The Old Testament has to do with commerce, business. And uh, look up the word commerce in a law dictionary. It's interesting. Look up the word commerce in a law dictionary. It will tell you commerce by law is sex. Sex is referred to as commerce. Uh, Then look up the word in a law dictionary. Look up the word uh, congress. You know, we love to have all these congressmen and people talk about the congress said today and congress did this. Look up the word Congress, what it means. Congress is sex. There's chorus and there's Congress. Now, where Congress does the word, is a sex act. Where does the word congregation come in? Is that derived well, from that as well? Yeah, well? yeah, that's a different, that's a whole different story. And that goes back to the word church. Church, church comes from a, a Scottish word, kirk, K-E-R-K, or K-I-R-K, kirk. Kirk in Scotland is church in English. That's why you have Captain Kirk on the good ship Enterprise, because that's what a church is. It's a corporation. That's why churches are divided into denominations, tens, twenties, and fifties, and hundreds. But when you get uh, Star Trek, you know, taking uh, Captain Kirk, Captain goes back to the word capital, which is, means money. Capitalizing means to, to put money into. So the captain of a ship, is, uh, you, know, you know, when you start breaking down the maritime admiralty words and terms, well, you know, what a what a story. Why, and it also has to do with the fact that uh, all all ships, rocket ships, sailing ships, any kind of a ship has to be female, always. That's why all captains will talk about their ship, whether it's an airship, an airplane, jet, whatever it is, it's always she. She's a good mm-hmm. ship, she's seaworthy, she's this, she's that. Because all ships by maritime amplity law are female. Why? Because she produces the product. Without her, there ain't no product. So she produces the product. She's the one that keeps business going. Without the woman, there is no business. So the men are going to die off, and that's it. It's over. No more business. The game's up. Why? Because the women are not producing. So the woman produces the product. That's why all ships are female. And, conse- and consequently, when a ship pulls into harbor, it's say, uh, you know, it, it's let's say it's bringing in eight hundred million dollars worth of Toyotas. Well, yesterday when you were at work, the ship wasn't here, but this morning you came in. There's a ship here. So it has manifested. Now, what is it manifested? Well, it manifested $800 million worth of business. So each one of those Toyotas or televisions or whatever came in on a ship. Ships come in on water. And so, therefore, each one of those uh, Toyotas or TVs has to have its own certificate of manifest. And so on each, each item has to have its own certificate. Uh, coming off the she is, is giving to the world. She's bringing it to you on water. She's parked at the dock. And so, um, and where a ship sits, because if she's a she, we say where a ship sits is her birth, B-E-R-T-H. A birth is where a ship sits. So the birth is, uh, is she is sitting in her birth, 
next to the dock, tied off at the dock. And therefore, every item has to have a birth certificate. So when you were born, you came out of your mother's water. You, her water broke. You are a maritime Admiralty product. She gave birth to you. She was in labor. And in labor, she produced you. And so since she produced you out of her water, you are a maritime Admiralty product. And she was sitting in her birth, so you have to have a birth certificate. And it's got to be signed by the dock, because that's where the damn ship was sitting, is at the dock. And so once you understand how money works, banks work, governments work, courts work, religions work, understand the way the whole entire planet works. It's maritime admiralty, the law of water. So we say, you know, money goes through your hands like water. No, money is water. You are 90% water. You are a maritime amplity product, or what is referred to as a human resource. Got rubber, iron, oil, and you. Well, let me ask you, how do we break free of all of this? How do we get away from the birth certificate and the Social Security number and, and all of that? Well, if you want to do that, you have to, first of all, rescind the power of attorney. You have to, you have to rescind the power of attorney on a birth certificate and you can do that. You can you can contact the uh, Social Security and tell them you do not wish for Social Security to represent you by law any longer and no longer to have the power of attorney over your birth certificate. Because that's why when you go into a court, they ask you, how do you plead? Well, if you don't want to plead, it doesn't matter. The judge can enter a plea for you. Why? Because he has the power of attorney over your body. He owns it. You just don't know that. You don't understand the court actually, in fact, owns your body because the court represents maritime admiralty, which is money, which is a stock market, and your birth certificate is on the stock market. You are nothing more than a maritime admiralty product. That's why if you're getting married and the, the woman or man that you're marrying comes from a wealthy family, we say, well, they are of good stock. Hmm. What do you mean stock? I'm not married a cow. <laughs> no, but they're good stock, meaning that they are a stock on the, on, the, on the New York Stock Exchange. But unlike you, who are poor, they are good stock. They are what is called premium, a blue chip stock. And you get blue blood from that as well. Yeah. And so if you're going to get married, incidentally, uh, every person's body is a corporation. That's the way they, they set it up. That's why the names are all in, in capital letters. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. So, therefore, if you are a corporation, when you die, you're a corpse. <laughs> why? Because that's what your body is. Your body is a corporation. And so now it's a defunct corporation. It's not doing much business anymore, so it's buried. There's no, it's out of business, but it was still a corporation. It's a corpse. And so when one corporation is doing business with another corporation... There's no problem with that as long as you understand a corporation operates under what is called corporate law. And mm -hmm. corporate law is part of maritime admiralty government. So if you're going to start a corporation, you just don't go out and put your hand on a rock one night and say, I'm going to be a corporation. No, no, you had better go file papers with the federal government and the state government stating that you want to file and, and start a corporation. You can do that but you better file it with the government. And once you file it with the government, now you find out that uh, being a corporation, you get certain privileges and perks, but you also have to now have a president of the corporation. And you have to have, according to corporate law, you have to have a vice president and a secretary treasurer. That's the law. All corporations have to have a president. Banks are corporations. They have to have a bank president. Mm -hmm. General Motors is a corporation that has the president of General Motors. President is a word which is used in commerce to mean he's the head of a corporation. Well, in order to start so a corporation, we, you need a president, a treasurer. You need about five different Yeah, offices. but the first three are the ones that you have to have. Okay. Uh, you have to have a president, vice president, secretary, treasurer. Right, right. Well, that's what we have. We've got Obama, who's the president. Mm -hmm. And that's why once a year... 
uh, all of your bo- uh, everyone's body as a security on the New York Stock Exchange for the corporation. So once a year, since the corporation is now dealing with the public, you have to have a stockholders meeting. So once a year, they have a stockholders meeting, but if you can't be there, you have your representative, which is a congressman and a senator, and he will be your representative or your proxy at the stockholders meeting because he's representing you as the constituents in his district. He's representing your body, which is one stock on the stock exchange, and he's got 700,000 people in his uh, in his area that he represents. So 700,000 times 6 million is a lot of money, so that's why the senator is very important. He represents to the corporation in Washington, D.C., the privately owned company, privately owned company called United States Corporation. He represents a lot of money. That's why he's Mr. So-and-so and Congressman So-and-so and Senator so and Why? Because he represents Maritime Amplity, your body, and 700,000 more like you in his district, which represents a lot of money. And now he's going to hear the president of the corporation talk about what has he done for the corporation. So once a year, you hear the secretary or you hear the speaker of the house say, ladies and gentlemen, the president of the United States, and everyone rises. Well, you better rise. He's the president of the corporation. You may hate him. You may know he's a scumbag. But you are merely a member of the corporation, and you had better stand and smile because he's the boss. Period. Amazing. This is a great, great discussion. Uh, you mentioned two things. You mentioned water and you mentioned the occult. And when I think of things hidden by water, I think of Atlantis. Does this tie into Atlantis at all? Of course, of course, of course it does. Absolutely. Maritime Amplity, the law of water and how water, you know, what they did. Maritime Amplity is the law of water. And the law of water is the law of business, commerce, money. Changing hands, so therefore you can get a you can get a, uh, a, a credit card in Japan and go to South Africa for a vacation. Why? Because it doesn't matter what color you are, where you come from. We're talking money. Do you have a credit card or don't you? Do you have the money in the bank or don't you? And so therefore, it has nothing to do with the law of the land. It has to do with money, and money is the same all over the earth. It's the cash flow, the liquid asset. And money goes through your hands like water. No money right. is water. So therefore, <clears throat> your question was again. Go back to your question. Oh, uh, does this tie into Atlantis at all? And I know they oh, yeah. they want to bring in the new Atlantis. Well, that's what America was supposed to be. America was supposed to be by the founding fathers. They said that. I've got documents uh, showing that uh, that the founding fathers said that America was to be the new Atlantis. And the new Atlantis in America was going to reestablish the Saturnian New Age, the New Age of Saturn. Saturn was the god of the and was lord of the ring. Mm-hmm. Well, even Christian, even Christmas is celebrated on, at the same time as the. Well, of course, of course. But see, a lot of people don't know that uh, you know Jews wear something called a yarmulke, it's a little skull cap. Mm-hmm. They they think that's Jewish. No, the Pope wears a skull cap. The Pope wears the yarmulke, not the Jew. The Pope, and the Cardinals wear the yarmulke, not the Jew. Cardinals in the Catholic Church, and the reason why is because the yarmulke is a Catholic Roman symbol for subjection to the papacy, subjection to the Pope. That's why the Cardinals and priests wear yarmulke. And the Jews in the Middle Ages were told to get on your knees before the Holy Father and to show respect for the Holy Father, you wear the Roman yarmulke. And so today we've got Jews running around the world wearing a yarmulke, thinking it's all bright and brilliant to be wearing a yarmulke, never realizing that's showing respect to the Holy Father in Rome, airhead. (laughs) Educated people, capable of critical thinking. They're not interested in that. And welcome back to Truth Frequency. I am Chris Gio, joined as always by my lovely co-host, Cherie. And on the line, we are speaking with Jordan Maxwell. His official website, once again, is jordanmaxwell.com. Our website, of course, is truthfrequency.com and broadcasting from polygraphradio.com. And um, 
let me let's go back to the conversation, Jordan. Um, we were talking about the yarmulke and the connection to the Roman uh, Church. We talked a lot about Rome and the Catholic Church, but let me ask you this: What's the history of the Jews? Because I was speaking with somebody the other day, and we were theorizing: Could they be the actual descendants um, from Sumar? I mean, are they the real Sumerians, or what's your take on that? Well, I wouldn't be a bit surprised that well, obviously they must be connected somehow. Um, but as I said, there is no actual Hebrew language. And Hebrew itself is a, is a derogatory term. That's not a very nice word in the in the old country, in the, in the Middle East today. That's not a very nice term. Calling somebody a Hebrew is a derogatory term. It simply means it's the same idea as calling a Mexican, illegal Mexican, a wetback. It's a derogatory term. It means uh, you came across the, you know, in a river and came uh, and crawled under a fence and you got a wet back and you come into this country illegally. So you're an illegal alien in a wet back. Well, in, in the ancient world, uh, Hebrew meant, it was actually Eberu, Eberu meant uh, one who crossed over illegally. So in Egypt, if you crossed over into Egypt illegally and came in as an illegal alien, they called you an Eberu or Hebrew. So Hebrew means somebody who, some scab who came in un, uh, undocumented into our country in, in Egypt. So they were called Hebrews. They have a lot of the words backwards. Um, I think I remember you mentioning that Yahweh actually yeah. meant uh, like uh, an orgasm. That's right. That's why, that's why <laughs> even Jewish physicists today will tell you that the whole universe came into, by, you know, God created the universe. And so the whole universe came into existence through a big bang. But come on, what are you talking about, big bang? Uh, and so, you know, I, I know what a gang banger is, but you're talking about God brought the whole universe into a big bang. Uh, the whole thing is ludicrous on its face. Once you understand the words and the terms for God, once you understand that there is no Hebrew language, there is a Phoenician language which the Hebrews speak, that's so like saying that you speak American American language. No, you're an American, but you speak the English language, not American. The same thing is true with Hebrew. Hebrews do not speak the Hebrew language. Hebrews speak the Phoenician language. The Phoenicians are the ones we call Canaanites, are the people who today we call Jews. The Jews are a Phoenician people. The Phoenician Canaanite people are today referred to, uh, referred to as Jews. So the Hebrews or Jews today speak the Phoenician language. There is no Hebrew language as such. Hebrew is not a uh, is not a an original language. Hebrew comes directly out of Phoenicia. Now, are these the Jews that we hear about who do the sacrifices and the the child sacrifices and rituals and things like that? Well, you know, I, 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 and that's kind of a difficult subject. Incidentally, they're still doing uh, human sacrifices here in L.A. I can take you places up here off of Mulholland Drive and Mulholland and Coldwater Canyon uh, where they still do uh, up until I, I, I'm, I've heard uh, even as recent as a couple of years ago, still doing child sacrifices up there in the hills of, of Hollywood. So. We still have a child sacrifice and human sacrifice right here in L.A. That's a that's a fact of you know that's a fact of life. Now the term Hollywood that actually comes from the magician's wand, isn't that correct? Yeah, yeah. The magician's wand. Uh, it's a it's an old Celtic druid symbol, the old Celtic druid system, uh, which controlled Europe before the Roman Empire ever came about. There was a whole system of government in Europe before Caesar, and it was a Celtic Druid system. And so much of the Celtic Druid system, of course, it was, it was uh, you know, brought into the Jewish system, so that the Jewish high priests are actually Celtic Druid high priests. And the Druids, uh, one of the main symbols in the old Celtic Druid system was a magic wand. Magic wands were always made out of a wooden, out of the wood of a holly tree. It's made out of Hollywood, and we still have Hollywood, uh, you know, working their magic on us. And you know, one of the gods of the ancient Hebrews was the planet Saturn. 
Saturn was one of the gods were, that we refer to as Yahweh. Yahweh was connected to uh, the the sex. It was connected to the sun. It was also connected to the planet Saturn. Uh, over the centuries, over the years, uh, it, it you know it it mutated and took on different meanings. But Saturn was a very important planet, uh, a very important god to the ancient Jews and ancient people. Uh, even on today, on the planet Saturn, if you you know when that uh, space probe went past Saturn and was photographing Saturn, I don't know if you know that or not, but there's a there is a hexagram on the North Pole of Saturn. Have you ever seen yeah. that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chris Everard mentioned that on the show yeah. when we had him on. Yeah, hexagram on planet Saturn. Saturn was referred to in the ancient world as Lord of the Rings. And so Hollywood is still making movies about Lord of the Rings. Their god, the god of the Hebrews, was Saturn, Lord of the Rings. And so they're telling you a, st- a story from the old ancient Hebrew and the old ancient Jewish system of religion. Today it's called Lord of the Rings. And so Gentiles go to see the movie and think it's beautiful, it's well done. Uh, but they haven't got the faintest idea what's going on, just like Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back and all this stuff. Or, you know, People go to these movies and they have no concept, no idea in the world what Hollywood is telling you. They're telling you something. But happily, again, I go back and say, but, but you know, what they're telling you in Hollywood, what they're telling you in television and movies, uh, most people just don't get it, and it's unfortunate. We're just so profoundly ill-informed and unread and so superficial and shallow that we don't think very deeply about anything until you are arrested and taken to federal court and charged with a capital crime. And since it's a capital crime, means that they're going to capitalize on your corporate body and if you are found guilty and cannot be bailed out, they're going to kill you. You will die because it's a capital crime, meaning it's going to cost you a lot of money to get out of this one. <clears throat> uh, you know, as I said, the United States is a corporation, privately owned corporation. But if you're working in this country, if you come in illegally and you're working here, then your your body is a corporation, but you are working and making money illegally, unlawfully. Therefore, the corporation can put a lien on you. It's like a mechanic's lien. You know, if you get a guy who paints your house and you don't pay him, he can put a mechanic's lien right, right. on your home, which means you cannot do anything with it until you pay him. And so if you sell the house, you must pay him first because he has a lien on the property. Well, if you come into this corporation called United States illegally and are working here, the corporation can put a lien on your body. You then become known as an alien. No, you, you there, there has been a lien put on you. Therefore, you are an alien. But we do use the term alien and never realize, no, it's a lien has been put on your corporate body. Uh, extraordinary interesting stuff I think when you begin to see how the church and government banks how the whole entire world around you in fact operates the way it does and again I started off by saying it and I'll say it again nothing in this world works the way you think it does well Jordan when when did all this start I mean when we were created by whomever we were created, this system wasn't put into place. When did all this no. start to happen? Well, I, you know, it's, 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 it's a mutation. And so being a mutation, things change. It's evolved over the years, over the centuries, over the thousands of years. Things have evolved <clears throat> because it became apparent very quickly that if you're going to do any real big business, you're going to need water. You're going to need trade with countries. That's where the real money is. Buying and selling in downtown for you is a little bit of money. But when America sells $800 billion worth of 
of uh, rice and, and foods to the rest of the world. Now you're talking business, but it's going on ships. And so this is why maritime admiralty is a law of water or the law of the ship, she. This is why when you're getting married, you have a court ship. And when you join the corporation, it becomes a citizenship. You're going to play the game. It's called sportsmanship. Uh, everything is ship. And if you go to Sears and buy a refrigerator, they're going to ship it to you. Uh, well, it's not coming out of water. No, but it's maritime amplitude, money changing hands. And it's a maritime amplitude product. <clears throat> and you're a corporation. And so you say, well, I don't buy this. Well, we mean you don't buy this. So it all has to do with business. Business, money, corporations, religion, churches. The very word church, you know, the very word church, I said that. How many Christians go to church and have no idea where the word church comes from? The word church is a Scottish word, kirk, K-E-R-K or K-I-R-K. But kirk was brought to Scotland. That word was brought to Scotland by the Knights Templars. The Knights Templars are what we today call the Scottish Rite. But when the Knights Templar Masonic Order, which was a Catholic Masonic Order, uh, went into the Middle East <clears throat> during the Crusades... They started the first uh, banking system, correct? Yeah, then they came back to Europe, and they brought with them, when they came back from the Crusades, a lot of artifacts and ideas and concepts and belief systems. And so one of the systems and one of the ideas they brought back, the Knights Templars brought back, was a was something called a Circe, C E R E S, Circe, or a, a Greek goddess Circe. <clears throat> it was a Phoenician god. It was a there was a Palestinian goddess. They were all goddesses in the Middle East, even in in, in Egypt. Uh, the same goddess existed, and it was basically Circe. Circe was a was a goddess who was able to hypnotize people, bring them into her home, locked the door behind them so they could not get out, took their minds away from them, and turned people into animals and pigs and fed off of them. Well, Sounds you like can the go, TV. You can go to the Austin State Capitol and find her on top of the building. Yeah, well, that's an appropriate place for her to be, on the Capitol <laughs> building. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All I'm saying is that when you start looking at the real world and put down the uh, the newspapers and turn off the television and all that silly nonsense that the masters are flooding the world with, or I like to say pouring into the human trough for us animals to lick it up. When you turn off the TV, or another better thing is turn on the TV but shut the sound off completely. And sit and watch all of the Fruit Loops, goofballs, airheads, dingbats, traitors, liars. Uh, watch all of these goofballs and, and just flip around the channel and all you see are talking heads, dingbats, airheads, uh, paid lackeys. And that's what you're consuming every day is all of that nonsensical prattle uh, and tripe. And you're taking that into your mind and trying to, you know, and... As I've said before, your decisions on life are only as good as your information. Well, that's an interesting word, consumer. Um, I was on the Internet the other day, and there was actually an article stated uh, that, that said how to be a better consumer. Yeah. Where does the word consumer come from? Well, I, you know, it obviously it comes from to, to consume, which means you know, you know, <clears throat> that's the way you do business. If nobody consumed anything, there would be no business. And so if you could get people uh, you know, on the take, uh, if you give them a little uh, free free dope narcotics, give them a little something free, once you get them hooked, now they want to consume it every day. So now you've got them hooked. So that's the way you do business. Now you've got somebody who's going to bring you money every day. And so it's just business, nothing personal. So consuming right, right. is a business. It's commerce. And so we have now been able to, uh, to um, how would I say, to take this into a professional operation now. We've, we've made it into a, a whole new operation called commerce on the earth, business. And the business is to consume, buy products, buy this, buy that, 
And the more you buy, the more you owe, and the more you owe, the more money the corporations make. And the more the corporations make money, the more influence they have, until one day you have a world run by business. It has nothing to do with anything moral or decency or or excellence. It has to do with money. It is one big business, money. ladies and gentlemen. And with Jordan Maxwell, um, and we're going to get into the Illuminati a little bit. A big shout out to everybody in the chat room right now. So let's get back to the discussion. Now, Jordan, you mentioned the Knights Templar earlier. Um, didn't they become the Illuminati at one point in time? Well, they are a part of that whole Illuminati system. But the actual Illuminati as such, I believe, can be traced back to the Jesuits. I think the Jesuits were the very first Illuminati. And today, uh, when you talk about Illuminati, I think that what you're talking about ultimately is the Jesuits. The Jesuitical system of religion in the Catholic Church is Illuminati. In my opinion, that's what we talk, when we use the word Illuminati and the dark forces, the secret societies and all the occult uh, mystical powers of the earth, that is Jesuit, in my opinion. And I've only been looking at this for 48 years, so I'm not the world's foremost, uh, I'm not the world's foremost authority on anything. <laughs> but that's my opinion. Yes, but well, 48 well, years, 48 has years me one sir. Thing. 48 years, that's no, 48 amazing. 48 years have taught me one thing. Jesuit, that's where the action is. How does this tie into the monarchs, though? I've heard two different sides. The monarchs rule, run the Jesuits, and the Jesuits run the monarchs. Well, basically, that's it. Yeah. The, you know, uh, look at all the monarchs in Europe. <clears throat> We're talking about the Western world now. But in in the Western world and Europe, uh, we we have something called the royalty, kings and princes and royalty, and all of the royalty are said to be able to rule by divine right. Well, you need to question: What are you talking about, divine right? It sounds as though you're talking about God gave them the privilege and right to rule me, divine right. Until you look at the word divine. This is why the Catholic Church has, uh, all ancient religions always have wine to represent the blood. Wine in the Catholic Church represents the blood of Christ. The Catholic priest drinks the wine on Sunday. Well, where, do wine, where does wine come from? <clears throat> it comes from crushing grapes. And grapes grow on divine. And, and so, therefore, divine gives us our whole idea of the crushing of the grapes, the holy wine, which represents the blood of the human race, and the earth is the, is the, uh, the holy uh, chalice, the holy grail, and our blood is the wine of the earth and the holy grail. Uh, well, I mean, I don't even know where to go with this because there's so much here. <laughs> it is. It's very difficult to try and and uh, explain something coherently when this has taken thousands of years to develop, and you have to spend many, many years looking at the words, the terms, the symbols, putting words with the symbols, putting those symbols with organizations, those organizations with uh, religion, government, commerce. And one day it will finally dawn on you that the entire earth is in the grips of gang. That's all it amounts to is gang war. I mean, the British are a gang, and they are at war with the Arabic gang. And the Arabic gang has their own bloodletting murderers over there, and their gang is at war with, uh, with this gang. And the American gang are, are one of the big gangs on the block, and they're at war with that gang, and the Russian gang, and the Russians have their mafia. And so all governments are gangs. They're organized, they're very, very well dressed, and they have the attorneys, but then so did the mafia. They're organized, well dressed, and have their attorneys. Well, like Michael Carleone said in Godfather 3, at the end of the movie, Godfather 3, he's sitting on the porch with his sister. And overlooking his life, he's saying, at the end of his life, he says, 
you'll remember in Godfather 3, he said uh, to his sister, he said, you know, as I, as I was growing up, I always felt the higher up you go in the world, the more legitimate and the more correct things had to be. Now that I know at my old age, it's just the opposite. The higher you go, the more corrupt it is. Absolutely. Well, if that's true, which it is, obviously, because our, 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 at the bottom, all of this is business. It's just corporations, the Vatican, as opposed to the uh, the Protestant world movements, as, a, as opposed to the Jewish world movements, as opposed to the Islamic world movements. All you're talking about are people and corporations and money and control gangs. There is nothing legitimate on the earth as just humans and just men. And men have this macho thing about our gang. and We're in control. And if you don't like it, we will kill you. And so this is what all men think this way. You know, the Arabs say, if you don't believe in Allah, that's fine. We'll just cut your child's head off and we'll kill you. Well, the same thing is true here in America. If you don't believe in the Lord Jesus and not washed in the blood of the Lamb and Saved by the Holy Ghost, then God help you, because we're coming after you. We're sending in the Marines. Right. And we're right. going to teach you to uh, to worship the Lord Jesus. And if not, the Catholic Church during the Middle Ages will cut your head off and tie you to a post and burn you and kill your children. Well, I know people in religious, uh, quote-unquote, authority, and their mindset is, well, God has put me in this situation, so it's something that I have to do. Anytime that they do something evil or or backstabbing or conniving. It's it's they, sick. They think they're like David. They think, oh, well, <laughs> the Lord has anointed me with all this power, so he must want me to use it in this way. Yeah, well, that's what I tried to tell the girl, but uh, she didn't buy it. So, <laughs> I mean, that, that's that's uh, so ludicrous. You know, try that on a woman. You write there, well, I mean, the Lord put that in me, and I just had to do it. You right, know? right. Yeah, and that's just like the Nazis. Well, you know, we were just following Hitler. And Hitler said, go out and kill these people. So we had to do it. After all, he is the government. And, you know, we have to we have to be in subjection to our government. Well, well so Romans 13. Says, go out and kill children. Well, that's what we have to do, you know. Romans 13 is the scariest. It says um, to submit to government because God has put him there. And that yeah, means and, and, and then when you start doing research on those scriptures and find out when was that scripture put in. When was that put in? Well, it was put in during the Middle Ages, during the uh, during the uh, pr prior to the Renaissance. There's so many things uh, and, and documents in relation to religion that was put in later by that, the church. That was when Rome was ruling, correct? Yeah, that's right. Yes. And and go on my trouble. website. But listen, here's here's a here's a, a dandy for you. You go on my website to uh, to links. Go on to links. And in the link, scroll down till you see religion, because uh, I've got all the different subjects in different uh, different sets of links. And on religion, you will see a, an especially large link that says that I believe this is the most important link in, for religion on the earth, and it's called Christianism.com. Just take a look at the 6,800 pages of documents uh, uh, plus about 40 different links that, that that one link has also. But that, but but just uh, Christianism.com has well over 6,000 uh, pages of, my, of minute, uh, highly uh, intelligent, minutely put together documents on religion, the church, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, where it came from, who paid for it, what what the documents said all over the world. It's the most extraordinary collection of wisdom and knowledge about religion ever assembled by anyone ever. I am absolutely amazed at this one website. The reason I know about it is because the doctor, the doctor who did this took about, he told me, he took about eight years out of his life. He told me, his name is a doctor down in San Diego, and I was in San Diego opening up a hippie coffee shop. I, I, we call it the uh, Thomas Paine Coffee House. And it was right across the street from the University of San, uh, of San Diego. And uh, I was opening this uh, coffee shop for young people and, you know, for books and lectures and stuff in the coffee house. 
And Steve Allen, the musician, comedian, Steve Allen, it was a dear friend of mine, and he came down with me to open up the coffee house because he was a big follower of, of uh, Thomas Paine also. And when we walked in, this doctor comes walking up to me and says, Jordan, I want to talk with you. And he said, you know, many years ago, I about 10 years ago, I heard a lecture. I was, uh, I was at a lecture you did in Los Angeles, and you were highly, highly offensive to me. The stuff you were saying about my religion, about my church, I was extremely uh, uh, unhappy hearing the things you were saying. But I couldn't shake the idea that you might possibly be right. So he said, so I sold my, my, my properties, I sold my practice, I liquidated everything I own, and for eight and a half to nine years, I've traveled the world reading and studying at all the leading universities and museums of the world, and I want you to know that you caused me to do this, so I'm giving you the end result of my nine years of study, and I call it Christianism.com. <clears throat> so he gave me boxes and boxes, heavy boxes, from his car to mine, of all the photocopies he had taken around the earth for nine years as a Ph.D., as a doctor, meaning he knows how to study correctly. And I mean, he has done one incredible job of seeking out documents upon documents in all the languages, translating them about where churches and religions have come from, where does synagogues come from, where does all of the stuff of religion actually come from. Go on my web. It's in, it's in links under religion called christianism.com and sit there and read for the next four years. You will be astounded at the brilliance of this man's work. I am. Wow. And that's and, just one. And that would be at jordanmaxwell.com, right? Correct. Okay. Very simple. Jordan like the river, Maxwell like the coffee, jordanmaxwell.com. Now, speaking of your website, I noticed you came out with two new DVDs. Can you give us a little synopsis of uh, Moses the Lawgiver? Yeah, Moses the Lawgiver. Everybody talks about Moses, they are the Moses this and Moses that. And we've got all these glorious stories about Moses. But there's a whole world of knowledge about Moses that virtually nobody's ever heard of. And I don't want to give away the secrets, but there's a world of knowledge about Moses, and Moses is involved in a lot of things that people... Even Jews have no idea in the world that Moses actually, who Moses actually in fact was, and what the word Moses means and where it came from and why he was called the lawgiver. Uh, and so I just do a, uh, a 90 minute <clears throat> or whatever it is, maybe it's an hour, hour and 90 minutes, whatever it is, uh, lecture on with pictures and documents on showing the stuff that Moses was really into that you have never heard. Now, um, does it have anything to do with the sacred brew called ayahuasca? Yeah, one 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 quarter of it does, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it has to Very do with nice. We had Dr. Rick Strassman on, and he's actually writing a book um, about the connection between ayahuasca, the Ten Commandments, and how Moses was possibly on ayahuasca at the time. That's right. Yep, you got it. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. But that's just one of about five different sections. That was one section on Moses and hallucinogenic uh, drugs. And uh, there's a lot of information on that in Israel and in Jewish publications that people don't know anything about. Never heard it. Never heard anything about it. It's all right there. All you got to do is just get interested and go do some research. But I've got about four other uh, interesting, nefarious things that Moses is, um, was involved with that has never been told. So, you know, like I said, the best thing to do is just get the video. You'll see what I mean. There's Excellent. all kinds of things. Absolutely. And then this other one called the Hidden Dimension in World Affairs. The Hidden Dimension in World Affairs, I'm talking about the religious backing behind uh, the world governments. All world governments have religious backing. 
And would you see the fascists of, uh, in Italy under Mussolini, the Nazis of the Adolf Hitler, in America under, uh, you know, behind the American government is the Vatican. Vatican is behind world governments, also behind America's government. You know, the United States Corporation is a Vatican operation. And if you go back to the history of Rome, you will see in the history books that uh, Caesar ruled from something called Capitoline Hill. Capitoline Hill was the seat of power for for the Caesars. So in the morning, it is said in the history books, go, look, go read the history books, go to the library, and you will see the history books will tell you that in the morning, Caesar, quote, would go up on the hill, end quote. Hmm. He would go up on the hill because he was going to officiate over the Senate. The Roman Senate was wow. up on the hill. So it's like Capitol Hill. That's right. Capitol Hill. Well, that's where he went, to Capitol Line Hill. Capitol Line Hill is today Capitol Hill. Same word in English. Wow. So Capitol Line Hill is where the Senate was, and so the Senate was Roman. And therefore, the the word senate, the very the word senator means an actor, someone who acts in a play is called a senator, and the Congress, of course, is sex. So you know, it, it's just an extraordinary story of the fascists, the Nazis, the SS, the Gestapo, the Vatican. All of this story that's never been told. I do a ninety minute or an hour ninety minute. Uh, presentation showing you documents, pictures, photographs <clears throat> of the whole world of the hidden dimension in world affairs. Stuff you've never been told about government, where governments come from, how they're financed, and how the church is the ultimate power behind all governments. How does this all tie into 2012? We ask every guest this because it seems like this agenda is counting down towards 2012. What are your views on that on that topic? Well, first of all, I'm not a, I'm not anywhere near being uh, knowledgeable on 2012. Although I've been in the company of the guys who are the experts, and I've heard all the experts. The one person that um, <clears throat> well, I, I've got so many friends who are really well read on that subject. I'll just give you my opinion. <clears throat> I think that 2012, incidentally, I have to cough a lot because I've had some very serious problems with my throat and my lungs. It's not a problem, sir, and not no at all. No problem whatsoever. And, and I've had doctors trying to keep me alive, working on my lungs and in my throat. I've got some very serious problems with my lung and my throat. But um, maybe it's because I've been talking so much for 40 years. <laughs> We're gonna, you're gonna be in our prayers because we need every brain like yours that we can get. Really, Jordan. I Absolutely. Mean, you are, you're, you're a veteran. Yeah, of, you are. Um, of this movement. Exactly. Well, I appreciate that, and I just do what I do, hoping that somebody will hear, because I'm not getting any younger, and I, you know, I just do what I do. If it's supposed to, somebody's supposed to hear it, they will. If they're not supposed to, they won't. Well, you've changed my life, like I told you earlier with that prayer. It took my life in a completely different direction, and everything started making sense. Every event that started happening in my life made sense to lead up to the next event, to the next event. And here I am hosting a radio show, no radio experience. We started calling up all these guests, Michael Sarian, Rick Strassman, everybody. Sure, we'll come on the show. We called yourself, and sure, we'll come on the show. We're getting the message out with you. That's, uh, well, I mean, you know, like the Bible has Jesus saying, you you have not because you ask not. Yeah, right. Exactly. <laughs> ask and you will receive. Knock Seek and you will find. Yeah, knock and the door shall be open unto knock you. Knock and the door, the door will be open. But if you're just sitting and watching basketball, then hell, ain't nothing going to happen. Absolutely. you got to get out there and do something, whether it's a radio show or um, write a book or get out there and talk to people or even do things for your own spiritual enlightenment. Um, we all need to start seeing things from a different perspective. And once we do start, start seeing things from a different perspective, we'll stop yelling at the movie screen and actually change the movie itself. So on that note, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a quick break. We are speaking with the legendary Jordan Maxwell. So, Jordan, let me get your take real quick. 
if you have any thoughts on this Austin plane crash that happened a couple of weeks ago. Well, <clears throat> I I, I, you know, I feel sorry for the guy because he didn't understand. Um, let me go back and you know just remember that question. If you have if you have a two story building and you're going to put a lot of weight on the second floor. <clears throat> logic alone would tell you that you need to go downstairs first with a building inspector, get on a ladder, and go up through the ceiling tiles and look at the, the foundation of that floor to see if it's going to hold that kind of weight. Uh, you know, Before you go putting printing presses and everything upstairs, you better find out what the timbers look like or how many, how many studs there are and if it's going to hold that kind of weight. <clears throat> so what you're doing is you're going downstairs to go under the foundation. So what you're doing is standing under the foundation, and that's where you get understanding. Because the word understand means to stand under a subject. So you don't really understand anything until you've really done your homework. And even any good lawyer, top of the line uh, federal lawyers will tell you, don't go into court unless you know what you're doing. You better watch what you say. You better watch what, what what you say when the cop stops you. You better know that nothing works the way you think it does. And when you open your mouth, you do not have understanding. And so you're going to get yourself in trouble. You need to call a lawyer who has been trained in a university, trained on how this crap works. <clears throat> because you're going to go to prison for a long time because you said something you thought was clever, but in legal terms, that means something else, and that's why you're going to jail. So that's why you need to sit quiet in a, in a courtroom and not get up and speak, because you're a dead man. That's why you have an attorney there who speaks for you. He's your mouthpiece, it's because he's representing you to maritime admiralty. You can even look at the word human being, for instance. And you think, oh, yeah. yeah, I'm a human being, but you look in a law dictionary, and it says sea monster. <laughs> <laughs> and, therefore, if you, and therefore, if you're looking for a job, there's a good company that gets jobs for you. It's called Monster. It is. Yep. Monster.com. Yep. Human resources. And uh, the definition of a monster is somebody who can never own land. That's right. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. why you don't own anything. You have a certified copy, but you don't have the actual document. It's just a copy that shows you that somebody higher up has the document, and you need it. You need to prove that that the document exists, so they will give you a certified copy. Oh yeah, I've heard people go to court and they um, they're they're getting their house taken away, and the people who are suing them, the banks, will go, "Well, I have a certified copy." I've heard people go up there and say, "Well, I have a certified copy of a check. Will you accept that?" No. Yeah. Well, why not? <laughs> you're where you're expect accepting a certified the certified copy. copy. Yeah. <laughs> Well, yeah, but the check is a check. Yeah. I don't want a certified copy of one. I want the check itself. Okay. Oh, okay. Uh -huh. Well, I have a certified copy of my birth certificate, but it's not your birth certificate. It's just a copy. Mm -hmm. right. And so you find out, no, no, the birth certificate is actually on the New York Stock Exchange, hmm. and it's being traded, and you are a human resource. You are, Your body is worth $6.5 million on the New York Stock Exchange. Oh, if we can jump back for a second. We were talking about the Jesuits. Um, what is the British-Israeli influence? Say it again. What is the British uh, – where does Britain and Israel come into play with all of this? Um, oh, heavens, yeah. Are they just Boy, tentacles? that's opening up a can of worms. Uh, <laughs> because, first of all, I do not believe that Judaism is a B.C. religion. I believe Judaism came into existence as a religion – about the 14th century A.D., only about uh, maybe 500 years ago. There was no ancient Israel. There was no King Solomon, King David, uh, Moses, uh, you know, none of that ever existed. Solomon was simply the word, uh, the, the, the name of the sun in the three esoteric languages. Everybody knows that or should know it. You've gone to school. Solomon is S-O-L-O-M-O-N. S-O-L is Latin for the sun in Latin, for the sun is Saul, S-O-L. O-M is Om in Hindu. Om is the 
as the word <clears throat> that is used for the creation is called Om, or the priest of Om. And On was the city of the sun, the Greeks call Heliopolis. Heliopolis was Helio, which is the sun, and Opolis is a government, or a, or a town, or a city. So the city of the sun was called Heliopolis, but Heliopolis is Greek. The actual Egyptian uh, name for the city of the sun was O-N, on. That's why you flip a light switch on, because it was a city of light, the city of the sun. So you take Saul, Om, and on, it becomes the King Solomon. No, it's the sun is King of kings and Lord of lords, God's son. Jesus is the sun, S. U-N, uh, not S-O-N. So God's Son is the light of the world. Of course the Son is the light of the world. And he is your risen Savior. God's Son is your risen Savior. Of course the Son is your risen Savior. If it don't come up, you're dead. And then the Egyptians and the Egyptians said that the Son was pure energy, which it is. It's pure energy, and the energy is not forever. It will not last forever and ever. It may last for thousands or millions of years, but it's not forever. And so all stars somewhere in time will burn out. Others are being new stars are coming in, but all stars are energy, and they're giving out their energy. So the sun is giving energy to the earth so that the plants can grow, you can grow, and life can, life can prosper on the earth because of the sun. So the story was that God's son, our risen savior, who is the light of the world, is giving his life so that you might live. Yeah, the sun gives you know, energy to the earth, and you get the energy, and you can live. So God's son is giving his life so that you might live. Would you start breaking down the encoded, esoteric encoded story of the New Testament, you begin to see it's sun worship. That's all right. Christianity is. Is it a plagiarism of um, the Egyptian religions um, and Horus? Of course. Yeah. Of course. But also, even more, more pointedly, uh, at the time that Christianity came into being in the Roman Empire, uh, the, the the primary religion of the ancient Roman Empire was called Mithraism. Mithraism was the worship of the sun, but it was the sun was personified in a god called Mithra. He was the sun, and he was referred to as God's son, and he had 12 helpers. Mithra in the ancient Roman Empire had 12 helpers. He had 12 followers. Yeah, the 12 months of the year, the 12 signs of the zodiac. So he had 12 followers. And he was uh, he died, and on the third day he rose again, and was and died on the cross. On December twenty second, he rose on December twenty fifth. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. He he yeah uh, he uh, he died on the twenty second, and was dead for three days: twenty second, twenty third, and twenty fourth. Which means uh, that the sun did not move in the lower when it went south. That's the whole story. But when the sun goes south, it ends up on December 22nd, hitting its lowest point in the southern sky. So on December 22nd, we know the sun has stopped going south. And then from the 23rd and 24th, those three days, the sun rises down south in South America. The sun rises on the same exact degree. And if you have those highly technical equipment that the U.S. Navy does, you will see the sun rises for three days three days on the exact same degree, which is the lowest degree it reaches in the southern sky. Then on the 25th, uh, your instruments will tell you that the sun has just moved on the 25th one degree northward. And so now it has begun its annual journey back to the northern hemisphere. Now it's going to begin the long journey coming back to the northern hemisphere. So we celebrate the God's son who was born again. And so he's born again on December 25th, and now he will continue to keep coming back toward us one degree at a time, each day, one degree, 30 days, 30 degrees, 90 days is a, is a quarter of the year, 
And 90 days later, or 90 degrees later, he finally gets up to three months. He finally gets to cross over the equator. On the spring equinox. On the spring equinox. And when he crosses over the equator, the ancient peoples in, in, in the ancient world celebrated what they called spring. And spring was the crossing over of the equator. And so today, when you die, someone dies, we say, Grandmother passed last night, or Grandfather passed away, or Grandmother passed on. But the word is passed, meaning they, they passed away. They're gone. And so that's what the Egyptians said. The sun, which was dead for three days in winter and didn't move, and on December 25th, that moved one degree northward, which means it's back to life again. So we celebrate God's son's birthday, S-U-N, God's son's birthday. And as he passes over the equator, we celebrate the spring equinox, and we call it a Passover, because the sun is passing over the equator, coming back to the northern hemisphere. So we call it the Passover. Well, of course, Christians can't celebrate the Passover, even though they are celebrating and, and worshiping the sun, but they can't celebrate the Passover because that's Jewish. That's the way the Jews celebrated Easter. And so what we do as Christians, we go out on Sunday uh, on, uh, at 5 o'clock in the morning and have something called an Easter sunrise service, where we all stand out there freezing in the early morning, 5 o'clock, and watch the sun rise. And so that shows you that Christianity is sun worship. They're out watching the sun rise at the Passover because the sun is passing over the equator, coming back to the northern hemisphere. And I'm screaming myself uh, into a, a hoarse voice <laughs> saying, why don't you wake up and discover Christianity is worshiping the sun while Jews are worshiping Saturn and the moon? while the Islamic world is worshipping Isis, or worshipping Venus. And Venus is called Lucifer. Wake up, get a life, educate yourself, and for the first time understand that knowledge is power. Go read a book. Well, I had a question about uh, Passover. Um, the Jewish people celebrate Passover because of, of well, this, what they say is, is that uh, with the Moses story, he said, let my people go, and, and at, in the end, it was the last plague, and they said that Passover was because they put the sheep's blood All over their I door. All of that What is your point? Um, well, isn't that where Passover came from? No, no, it's a story. That's what the Bible's called the greatest story ever told. It's a story. Well, now, what's the story of, of Easter? Well, now we've got a story about Easter. Ask the Christians, what does Easter mean? And then, of course, you have uh, Ramadan, so ask the Islamic world, what does that mean? It's just a story. The Jewish historians and archaeologists, the two leading archaeologists in Israel, uh, wrote a book a couple of years ago called Unearthing the Bible. And they are the two leading, top-of-the-line leading experts uh, in archaeology in Israel. They wrote a book not the only ones, but they wrote a book called Unearthing the, the Unearthing the Bible, in which they said in their book, nothing that we have been told in Judaism is true. Nothing. There was no Moses. There was no Abraham. There was no Isaac and Jacob. There was no crossing the Red Sea. None of it. It's just a story. So obviously, the Jews would have a story, well, so did the Islamic. They've got a story about uh, about Muhammad. Well, even Moses. And how Muhammad talked to God and rode up to heaven on a, on a horse, and he did this and he did that, and, and all these wonderful things that Muhammad did, unless, of course, you find out that there was no Muhammad, and the whole thing is just a story. Well, the Moses story, that was just taken from Egypt, from Sargon. Well, of course it was. Yeah. Of course. It was just taken from Egypt, and the Egyptians got the story from the Phoenician Canaanites, and from the Assyrians, who in, in, in Assyria, there was a king, uh, what was his name? Uh, I can't remember the king's name right now. In Assyria, who was, uh, who was found in a, uh, in a little cart, a little basket in a river. 
uh, the king was found in a little basket in the river and taken into the house of the king, and he was raised as the son of the king and uh, took over the kingdom. And actually, he was the lawgiver. He was called the great lawgiver, and he was found in a basket in, in the river. And the and the, the the princess found him and brought him in and raised him, and he became the great lawgiver to the Assyrian people. And the whole story, that's Moses. That's where right. the Moses story right. comes from. Well, I mean, look at what they did with religion, though. And this was my biggest block, and I can imagine how it's everybody's biggest block. Um, they make you believe that you're going to go to hell. You're going to burn forever if you don't believe yeah, what no. they tell you. It, it was very hard for me to say Christianity is not true. Uh, everything that I've been told is a lie. And that was the last step. But once I crossed that over, my life changed significantly. Things started opening up, and then I'll find a piece of information, and then I'll hear the same thing from three, four different sources confirming it over and over and over again. Well, I know, I know. But look, at what I told you, when I was a child, I've said this before, when I was like 9 or 10 years old, I was confirmed, like all other 10-year-olds in the, in the Catholic Church. And it was called confirmation. And uh, we were told by the nuns uh, the day before confirmation, we were told tomorrow at church, tomorrow evening at confirmation, uh, the bishop is going to be here. And the bishop may possibly, after the service is over, uh, the bishop may say to you children that if you have any questions, the bishop will try and answer your questions. So if the bishop does that tomorrow night, you just remember, you don't have any questions, period. You don't ask any questions. You sit quiet. And so that the next night after the service was over, Bishop P.J. Tulin from Mobile, Alabama, the bishop came over. And after the, uh, the, the, the ceremonies were over and we were all confirmed, uh, the bishop did say, he said, now that we are, now that you are all, Catholics, uh, you know, now that you made a wise decision, an intelligent decision at nine years old, that you are now a Catholic, uh, if you have any questions, your bishop will try and answer them. Well, we all knew nobody has questions, period. So I stood up to make damn sure they know who I am. <laughs> and I said, you know, I don't want anybody hearing just a voice. I want everybody to know who I am. And I stood up and I said, yes, I have a question. I said, my father works with torches. He's like a welder. And my question is, if I had a torch and there was an angel next to me, could I burn the angel? Would it hurt him if I hit him with the torch? Would it burn the angel? And he says, well, no. And I said, why not? He said, well, an angel, you can't burn an angel. You know, a fire is a, is a phenomenon, is a physical thing. You have to have wood or paper or plastic or something to burn, but you can't burn an angel. And I said, why not? And he said, well, because uh, angels are spirits. You can't burn a spirit. And I said, well, then why am I told that I'm going to burn in hell if my spirit's going to burn in hell if you can't burn a spirit? <laughs> oh, At nine that's years amazing. Old. Amazing. And so you know, then the priest looked at me and said, you, yes, yeah, sit down and shut up. <laughs> and so, I, you know, it didn't take me long to figure out there's something going on here. There are stories going on here, but even to a nine-year-old's mind, this doesn't make sense. Uh, I'm going to burn in hell forever. You can't burn a spirit. And then I find out later on, I found out later on, that hell is a Hebrew word or a Phoenician word, which the Hebrews speak, uh, sheol. Sheol in, in, in the Hebrew language, sheol, is hell, translated hell. Well, what does she all mean? She all means uh, your burial spot where you're buried. So therefore, the mankind's common grave is she all. It's hell. So when you say someone went to hell, you know it means they all go to hell. When <laughs> when you die, you go to a grave. And grave in, in the Phoenician language was she all, which is translated hell. This is why when you this is why when you're going to bury your head, you put it into a helmet. It's going to cover your brain. You're burying your brain in a helmet uh, because hell is where you bury something. So That's interesting. I've always thought of hell as being the furthest away from God that you could possibly be. 
Well, uh, look at look at when you're in the grave and dead. That's about as far away as you're going to get from anything. Do you think there's anything after this life? Oh, of course there is. I have no doubt in my mind about that. Absolutely, no yeah, doubt about it. I, I, you see, when I talk about God, I know the difference between God, which is dog spelled backwards. That's why you have church dogma. I know the difference between God and dog, and words and terms. But on the other hand, I have the highest of admiration and respect for spiritual knowledge and wisdom. I am totally convinced beyond the shadow of a doubt that there is a very, very powerful, phenomenally brilliant, powerful presence in the universe that men have called God, uh, the Great Spirit, the All-Father. I don't care what you call it. I don't care what name you give it and what language you come from. There is an overwhelmingly obvious, a divine, brilliant power in the uh, in the universe that oversees all things. So that is supposedly the concept of God. Well, I don't have any pro- problem with God. I totally see it. I appreciate what God is. I understand it. I just also understand your your silly ass churches and your synagogues are nothing more than. 501c3 corporations and maritime admiralty, and it's all a bunch of gang wars. But when we talk about stuff that's out there in the universe, that's a highly divine power of the universe, I don't have any problem with that. I absolutely uh, I agree. No, it's like you said in your lecture, there's a god that's above all the gods of religion, and that's I it. think he's very, very disappointed with us right now. No, you kidding? I'm disappointed. You can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. God is too big for one religion. I'll tell you. Yeah. And uh, I'm disappointed. So I, I know if I'm disappointed and I don't want to talk to people, I know God is. Whatever God is, I, I know it's not on TV and it's not in Trinity broadcast. Absolutely. I mean, I'm very disappointed with what I'm seeing. And um, it's funny that you mentioned that because we get attacked a lot uh, for talking about these esoteric and occult topics. But I think this is what people need in order to wake up. And um, maybe we won't be so disappointed later on down the line. That's why I'm doing the radio show. That's why we're on here um, doing what we're doing. And uh, we thank you so much for, for coming on the show, Jordan. Uh, when we get back uh, from this break, we're going to wrap it up with Jordan Maxwell. This is Truth Frequency. And we are broadcasting from Polygraph Radio, so we'll be uh, right back in just a few minutes. We are wrapping it up with Jordan Maxwell. We've uh, had him on the line for about two and a half hours now. So a big thank you, Jordan, for joining us for such a long time. Now, let me ask you a question um, because it was on my mind before the break. Uh, You were talking about the son being Saul or Saul being the son. Well, that brought to mind the story of Saul when he fell down and then he rose as Paul. Does that have any significance whatsoever? Well, that's S-A-U-L, Saul. Uh, so not but the other is S O L Saul, which is Latin for the sun. But S A U L is uh, the Apostle Paul. And see, I don't think there was an Apostle Paul. I don't think there was a Jesus. I'm sure there was none of that. It's all a story. That's why when when uh, I was asked a few minutes ago about the story about the the you know the Jewish story about the uh, the Passover, yeah, it's just a story. That's a Jewish story. But then you have an, and you have an, a Christian story. Well, that's not true either. Well, then you have the Islamic story. Well, that's not true either. Well, then you've got the Democrats, and they have a story. Yeah, but that's a lie, too. Well, what about the Republicans? And they've got a different story. Yeah, and that's a lie, too. It's all a bunch of lies. It's all a bunch of stories. That's why the Bible's called the greatest story ever told. It's not the greatest collection of facts. It's the greatest story ever told, and why? The Bible is the greatest story ever told because it's the only story that's ever been told. It's the same story that the Phoenician Canaanites were telling, the Sumerians, uh, the Zechariah Sitchin uh, will tell you the same story the Sumerians were telling as the same ones the Greeks told, the same words the Romans told, is the same story that the British told, and today is the same story, so that's why it's called the greatest story ever told. It's just a story. Period. 
Let me ask you this. Uh, let me change the subject for a second. Um, you mentioned Zechariah Sitchin. How did the Anunnaki play into all of this? Were they, were they the ones that came down and genetically engineered man? Well, the Anunnaki, according to Zechariah and according to, I guess, the, the records, were uh, um, entities who um, created us. Um, and that's what the Bible says. Are these the gods of religion? No, no, not at all. No, uh, no, that's different. Zechariah Sitchin, uh, I was going to say that Rabbi Marvin Antelman, that's what I was going to say. Rabbi Marvin Antelman, many years ago, I was talking to him about this, long before I ever knew anything about Zechariah Sitchin. We're talking about in the 60s. And, um, and Rabbi Antelman, I asked him, I said, what is, what is going on here with this... Uh, uh, the story in the Bible, in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And and the things he was telling me and explaining, he said, well, Christians and Jews both are totally confused because nobody does any real you know, scholarly research. And he said, but when the Bible, uh, he told me, he said, the Bible does not say that God created man. There's nowhere in the Bible that specifically says God created man. doesn't say that. Go back and read it correctly like a good lawyer would. Read it correctly. It says, uh, God said, come, let us make man in our image after our likeness. He says, what most people are misunderstanding is they think that, that God is talking to himself, I guess, and he's saying, come, let us make man in our image after our likeness. He said, that's not saying God made man. Read it correctly. It's saying God said, come, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So man was already here. And they Man's changed already us. here. But please, absolutely. So let us make man in our image. Let us make him in our image, in our likeness. Because for being so great, he's not that great. Neanderthals, they spell, they harry, they kill each other, they eat their own children. They're crazy. Well, we, we do that now, though. Well, yeah, well, that's true. Ever seen Jerry Springer? <laughs> and so, and so, you know, so therefore, it is not evolution, it's intervention. The word is intervention, not evolution. Intervention means somebody very intelligent from somewhere out there in the universe and ask any child of seven years old where God is, and they will point out there. And where do angels come from? Out there. Well, I'm afraid to tell you that if God and the angels come from out there, in the sky, that means they're extraterrestrial. Hmm. If they come from Cincinnati or New York, then they're terrestrial. But if they come from out there, that means they've come from extraterrestrial. Well, if they're extraterrestrial, then who is to say who these gods are who created us and said, come, let us make man in our image, after our light. And now man has become as one of us. Now, man has become as one of us. He's like us now. And see what you've done? <clears throat> you've given to this creature, this hominid creature, Neanderthal or, or Cro, uh, Cro-Magnon man or whatever these creatures were, and you cross-breeded with their females and put some of your DNA into her, and she has now produced half gods and half animals. Well, that's what humans are. We're half godly and half animal. And half of us is animalistic, and the other half of us is, is spiritual, and we're able to create uh, lasers and go to the moon and, and conduct beautiful music and have sciences and uh, you know all kinds of phenomenally brilliant stuff that we are able to come up with. But we also can get drunk, drinking, raping, street fights, and be like any other animal and dog in the street. And so, therefore, we have the potential to be both a dog or an animal or extraordinarily brilliant looking into the heaven. 
So I think that that's because somebody intervened in our natural evolution a long time ago and said, come let us make man in our image. After our like I think it's in the book of Enoch where they say that the Elohim came from somewhere in Orion's belt. That's right. Okay. Exactly. You're right. Okay. Well, anyway, Jordan, it's been an honor and a privilege to have you on our show, and I just want to say thank you so much. Can you tell people your website one more time and the uh, DVDs that are out? Yeah, it's just Jordan like the river. It's Jordan like the river. Jordan. It's J O R D A N. Jordan Maxwell. Dot com. Great. It's all Great. there, and um, go to my links. And when you go to my website, go all through it. Don't just look at the home page and, and go back to watch basketball. Go all through my website. There's all kinds of stuff on my website that people are asking me questions 24 hours a day. And they write me and they call me and ask me questions that are sitting right there on my, on my uh, website. The answers are right there. And then when I ask people, well, did you see my website? No. And they'll say, well, yeah, I saw your website. I said, what did you, did you go to the links? No. Did you go to the audio video page and listen to the stuff there? No. Did you go to the pictures? No. Well, then what did you see? Well, we saw your picture on the home page. <laughs> so if you're going to go to my website, yeah, if you're going to go to my website, go all through it and look at the stuff you've never heard. It's all right there. And all, and I can't take time to come to your home and sit down with you and show you how to scroll up and down and how to go into a website and, and, and investigate it. All I can say is that those who are supposed to see will, and those who are not supposed to see won't. So if you're supposed to enlighten yourself and wake up and get a life, then go to my website and go all through it. Check it out. Check out all the research boxes, all the research departments, all the all the uh, links. There's a massive amount of information there that most people have been looking at my site for years, didn't even know was on it because they didn't bother to do any real research. And that's what's killing our country. People don't know how to read or do any research on anything. I'm just amazed. They can barely use Google. Oh. <laughs> yeah, and so uh, just go on jordanmaxwell.com, check it all out. It's all there. Email me, too, because I'm going to start my own private uh, research organization very soon. And if you want to be a part of my project and my research uh, company, uh, then put your name in on my home page. There'll be a, uh, there's a place in there, a little note saying put your email in if you want to be a part of Jordan Maxwell's operation soon and then I'll be able to get back to you and tell you what we're going to do because I'm going to stop talking to the public. I'm not, not going to be talking to the public much longer. Okay. I figure 48 years is enough. <laughs> enough is enough. I've had enough, and now that the world is finally waking up, I don't care. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me if the public wakes up or not. I intend now to, this is my idea, I intend now to preach to the choir only. I don't care if the public wakes up. I couldn't care less if they're finally starting to wake up to what's going on. I don't care. I've been doing it for 48 years, and my feeling is is if you, at, at, at this late point in time on the earth, at this late time, you finally starting to wake up, well, it's about time. But don't come to me because I'm not going to be there. I'm going to talk only to those people who want to know. I'm not here to entertain anybody. Well, Jordan Absolutely. Maxwell, I'm you, are, you are a legend, and we really look up to you. Yeah. I, I know you've inspired um, Chris uh, on a lot of this occult stuff. I mean, you know, he, he knows so much more than I do uh, in this regard. <laughs> That you know, I have a I have trouble keeping up with him all the time, and I'm I'm sorry about the rude Passover question. Um, oh no, that's all right. It's, uh, I'm glad because it gave us it gave me an opportunity to, to explain to an audience, not just you, but explain to the absolutely. audience. Absolutely, and yeah, you know, I mean, ask any rabbi, uh, you know, and they'll tell you the story of their religion. Doesn't mean it's true. It just means you ask, they'll tell you. Right. Like Rabbi uh, Antoine told me once. I said, Rabbi, tell me the truth. I, I said to him once in a, ready, I, in a telephone conversation, I said, Rabbi, tell me the truth. Was there a Solomon and King David and 
and, and King Saul and all these names and all these people and Abraham. And he said, look, at everybody's got a religion. I mean, the Catholics have got a religion. The Buddha's got a religion. Everybody's got a religion. So leave me alone. i got to have a religion, too. <laughs> so, you know, you have Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. The, uh, in Hindu, it's Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva. In Egypt, it's Osiris, Isis, Horus. So we got to have a triune God, too. Our God is a triune God, just like all gods are triune gods. Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, Osiris, Isis, Horus, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Well, we got to have a triune God, too, he told me. So we got Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And I said, yeah, but was there an Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? He said, no, but there was no Brahma, Vishnu, Shiva, either. It's just a religion. Give me a break. i got a, I got wife and kids that I support. <laughs> well, I have... I have one more question for you, um, and this kind of ties into what you were just talking about, about creating a research, research organization. I've been thinking the last few weeks about how how sucked into mainstream media people are to the point where they, they'll they hear the mainstream media talking to them like they're a five-year-old, and they're, they're just like, yeah. oh, okay, okay. Well, exactly what they're saying is exactly what they mean, when really it's the opposite. What they're saying to us is the opposite of what they actually mean. And um, well, of course. so I was thinking maybe we could create some sort of New World Order dictionary where you could put, like, uh, preemptive action really equals um, what yeah. that really means is, right. you know, attacking countries for no reason. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, yeah, and, uh, and it's funny because uh, it's actually hilarious. It's actually funny when you start looking how – People change words, you know. We don't want to use uh, we don't want to use that word. It's not polite company. Right. So we'll we'll we'll, we'll say it's something else. We'll we'll give it a different name. No, it's, uh, a kid, a child will tell you. No, no. <clears throat> you know, you can give it all the, the nice fancy names you want. But it's still the same thing. Yeah. So um, I just want to stop my own research society. So if you want to be a part of it and hear what I'm doing and be a part of it, just go on my website. JordanMaxwell.com. Put your uh, email in, and you'll be hearing from me. And check out all this stuff that's on the website. A lot of interesting things there that people have never seen before. Absolutely, and I'm sure you hear this all the time. But you have done wonders to raise the consciousness of mankind and to make people more aware. And we applaud you. And it's been a real honor and a privilege, like I said earlier, to have you on the show. Um, best of luck to anything that you work on in the future, and may you have many, many more years here. Thank you very much for your time. Absolutely. And uh, Jack Blood says hello. I just spoke to him earlier today. He says, make sure you tell him hi for me. <laughs> so, oh, right. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Tell, tell everybody hello for me, too, when you talk to them. And we'll, we'll be praying for for your throat and your and your lungs. Is Thank it, you. Is it kind of like a COPD type <clears throat> I don't of? know what it is. It's just I, I, I've, had, I've had a very – bad situation with my throat and my lungs and my heart both happily i have some doctors who are good friends and they're trying to help me the best they can good very good our phone is always open to you if you need anything don't hesitate to ask absolutely thank you very much all right email me anybody wishes to email me and uh and i'll try and get back to you try and get back to you i get like 150 200 emails a day <laughs> and uh so i can't get back to everybody but i'll try and go on my website and email me. And uh, thank you for having me on the show. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. You have a great evening. You too. Bye-bye. And once again, ladies and gentlemen, that was Jordan Maxwell. His official websites are jordanmaxwell.com. And um, don't forget to pick up his new DVD, Moses the Lawgiver and the Hidden Dimension, available at his website. And there's a lot of good talks and interviews with him on YouTube, so be sure to check that out. In the three hours that we spent with him, we only touched upon the uh, just the tip of the iceberg of the information this guy has. So uh, one of the great researchers out there, uh, he's up there with David Icke, Michael Sari, and he's actually uh, influenced a lot of those guys, like we were saying in the same broadcast. So this is really the granddaddy of it all.